decision of both the upper tribunal and the first tier tribunal, so we know what this is about. Thank you, my lord. Um, that being the case, the last trade in, we say there are five uh, agreed facts on which the termination of this appeal rests. The first is that the re respondent was employed by the Met Police. The second is that litigation was brought against the Met for unpaid earnings. Thirdly, a settlement was reached in the sum of 4.2 million plus agreed uh, costs. Fourthly, the agreed costs are not taxable because they do not arise from employment. And that's, the, that's the fraud issue. It, it, well, the, now, the that's now the of issue, I think, isn't it? Yeah, well, the, the agreed costs don't arise yeah. from, yes, but precisely the of issue, if you can put it that way. And fifthly, had the 4.2 million been paid directly to the respondent and other officers without litigation, uh, both parties accept that that sum would be taxable. The dispute between us is whether as a consequence of the respondent entering into a damages-based agreement, the 4.2 million should be reduced by the success fee and insurance fee and premium imposed under the damages-based agreement. Uh, before being subject to tax, or whether the whole of the 4.2 million should be subject to tax because its character was unpaid earnings at all times. The upper tribunal uh, found that the word profit in section 62 of ITIPA should be interpreted as net profit, and for reasons which I'll come to in a moment, we submit this was an erroneous starting point because section 62 and the word profit is not being used in a fiscal sense, so much as it's being used as a word to determine the whole amount of a person's earnings, and so that deductions can be applied to determine the net taxable earnings. Can I, the, this issue of profit, am I right, doesn't seem to be argued in front of the first tier? The first tier's decision is all on the what you might call the from issue. Yes. So this surface did it for the first time in the upper tribunal? It, 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 first, it, it would be wrong to say it didn't arise at first. Instance, right. But it, so Judge it, Brannan doesn't deal with it. The, the, the first instance decision, and, and in fact argument before Judge Brannan, very much centred around whether the uh, settlement of the success fee and the insurance premium were from the litigation or from the employment. Oh, I see. And so you, you can see that towards the end of Judge Brannan's decision where he says it doesn't matter if you appeal to form or substance. Uh, at the end of the day, this is all earnings and that's all we really need to deal with. Yeah. And so he cut, rather cuts through the issue, if I can put it that way. It did gain a uh, central significance before the upper tribunal during the course of the hearing. Right. My Lord, may, may I intervene briefly? Yes. Uh, my Lord, I'm, I'm not sure I, I agree with that in, in entirety. Um, it, the, the, profit is, the profit issue was the main issue which was relied on by me in the first tier. Oh, I meeting. see. Um, you are right, sir, that it, it was ignored in the decision of... Well, of I couldn't see it, any discussion of it by Judge Brown. No, sir. My, my skeleton argument... The only difference in the upper tribunal was that um, that was the first time where I referred to the reimbursement cases, so right. Bucano and, and Donnelly. I um, the, my submissions in the first tier were based squarely on, on, on Lord Denning's statement in, in Hosrasa. Yeah. and the interpretation of profit. Right. One other question while I'm interrupting. Yes. Um, the memorandum which preceded the settlement said that the Met would tax the 4.2 million. Did they actually do that? Was there a deduction made by the Met which Mr Murphy and others now want to recover or was there no deduction ultimately made leaving the position simply between my, my understanding is that the, dedu the deduction was made. The deduction was made. Uh, so so there, there is a, a discovery assessment, I think it was, um, to recover the money. Um, now, I'm sure I'll, I'll be told if I'm wrong, but that, that's certainly my understanding. So Mr Murphy wants to get that tax deduction back. Yes. That bit in, yeah. yes. My, my Lord, should, sorry, shall I just intervene? Yes. I, I think what happened was that um, uh, the Met did apply PAYE to the payment. And Mr. Murphy then completed his tax return, excluding the um, uh, set the success fee and insurance premium. That rose a, re, uh, a repayment to Mr. Murphy, which my understanding is hasn't been taken yet. It's, it's sitting as a debt with HMRC, and HMRC then raised discovery assessments in relation to that amount. 
I think that procedurally that, that's what's happened. Right. So at the moment, he's actually owed money by HMRC subject to the determination. If he, win, if, if he wins this appeal, he's owed money by HMRC. If he wins, the, if he, if he wins this appeal, the discovery assessments are set aside and he has a, he's owed money by HMRC. Right. So my Lord, the, the answer to your question is yes, he would be owed money, but there is a discovery ses assessment that's sitting out there in effect. Um, to make the submissions good that I raise about the profit issue, uh, I'm incredibly compelled to, to walk you through uh, the legislative pathway in ITEVA, um, although I'm hopeful that I shouldn't have to take too long to do so. Um, can I invite you to turn to tab five of the uh, authorities bundle on page 23? Sorry, page? 23. 23. Yep. I see this has been superseded. Has it very much changed, the current legislation? Not, not over much, no. This is one that's enforced at the time. That this yeah, I'll follow. Yeah. Um, Section, this is section six, which deals with the nature of charge to tax on the employment income uh, and deals with uh, the charge to tax arising on general earnings uh, and specific employment income. Uh, for today's purposes, we're only dealing with general earnings uh, and they're defined in section 6.2, the amount of general earnings or specific employment income which is charged to tax in a particular tax year and it's set out in section nine. At page 25 uh, of the authority bundle, uh, this is section 7 of IT, but dealing with the meaning of employment income and general earnings. Uh, and again, for our purpose, it's only section 72A, employment income, and section 73A, general earnings, mm -hmm. that my lords and my lady are concerned with. The references in both section 72A and 73A to earnings within Chapter 1 of Part 3 as a reference to the definition of earnings in Section 62. And I, we'll have to come back to these early provisions, but it's probably helpful at this point to interpose Section 62 to see it in that context. And that's found at page 35 of the authority bundle behind Tab 6. Uh, under the heading uh, earnings, it states this section explains what is meant by earnings in the employment income part. And I don't think it's in dispute uh, by the respondent that we're dealing with the employee employment income parts of ITPA. Uh, they're parts 3 to 7A uh, of ITPA. In 62 2A, it's dealing with salary, wages, and fees. Uh, and in my submission, and to the extent it's necessary to have regard. Uh, to uh, these provisions or these words uh, in construing section 62 2b and um, we say that plainly it's talking about uh, the gross value of salary wages and mm -hmm. fees at 62 2b the words any gratuity or other employment uh, or incidental benefit of any kind obtained by the employee that's money or money's worth uh, it's the word profit as you no, in this provision, which led the upper tribunal to conclude what was required was an assessment of whether there was a gross or net profit, and in doing so, I submit the upper tribunal effectively permitted the respondent to make an otherwise unallowable deduction from the profit which was from the employment. That is to say, a deduction that would not, not otherwise have been allowed under ITPA from the settlement sum which represented the respondent's earnings from the employment. And just to be clear, it's common ground, is it, that if the full money is caught, it has to be because mm -hmm. of the word profit? Yes. Yes. Uh, I obviously need to come back to this provision in, in a little more detail, but it's important to finish that legislative uh, pathway that I was uh, starting with earlier. Before you so, do, yes, um, my lady. Um, you say it would. Maybe you're right on the facts of this case would permit an otherwise un, uh, unallowable deduction, but you don't need to go that far, do you? Um, you can say that hypothetically it might permit an otherwise unallowable deduction. 
but the question of whether the deduction is allowable or not comes at a later stage of the analysis. My lady, yes. Uh, and to some extent, you, you, my lady's preempted where I, I will be going in this case, but we say to the extent that the upper tribunal started using language like necessity and importing those concepts into whether it was from the employment, mm. uh, it, it really went much too far. Uh, and, and in fact, necessity is, is almost a red herring. Yes. Because it may or may not have been necessary, but that doesn't assist you in your analysis of whether it's from the employment. We well, all rather, uh, being, being very simplistic about it, um, because I try to be, <laughs> um, essentially you're saying if you gain anything in the sense of um, you, are, you are remunerated in money or money's worth, or what services you provide to your employer, that is intended to be caught by these sections one way or the other. So salary, wages or fee, that's straightforward. Uh, a gratuity, a tip, something like that, again, is something that you get um, a, a, an incidental benefit. Well, no, that, that's a catch-all. And profit, it's a bit like um, a profit from land, for example. So it's been used in that sense rather than in the sense of balancing out yes. profits uh, and losses. My lady, precisely. We, we say it doesn't require a fiscal analysis or a... It, we see it in the upper tribunal decision where it refers to a, a calculation for the word profit. And, and the, the well, choice you say this is this part of the structure of the code is dealing with the credit side, and then another part of the code deals with the debit side. But precisely, my lord. Precisely. Um, if we can now turn back, please, in the authorities bundle to page 27. Uh, this is section uh, 9, dealing with employment income charge to tax. So this is what brings in the charge to tax. The reference to employment income is a reference to section 7.2a. We know that because in employment income is a defined term. And at 9.2, it states, in the case of general earnings, the amount charged is the net taxable earnings from the employment in the year. It's necessary to pause on this provision for a moment because we say it's important for three reasons. The first is that it's clear that where Parliament have intended for the word net to form part of the provision, it has expressly used the word. Secondly, it's also important that in, uh, in that net taxable earnings, is a defined term, which I'll come on to shortly. And the third element of importance we say is the amount charged tax must be from employment. Moving on then to sec uh, subsection uh, three of section nine, that amount, uh, and that amount must be the net taxable earnings, is calculated under section 11 by reference to <coughs> any taxable earnings from the employment in the year. The use of the word taxable earnings here is another defined term and it's defined in section 10 uh, which uh, we'll come to again shortly but completing section 9 first 96a uh, makes clear that no amount of earnings <coughs> is charged to tax unless the earnings are taxable earnings from the employment. Uh, over the page now, page 28, uh, this is the meaning of taxable earnings uh, and taxable specific income, but again, we're just dealing with taxable earnings here. Uh, they are from an employment in a year to be determined in accordance with chapter four. So the use of the word there, to be determined in accordance with chapter four, uh, or five. But for present purposes, only Chapter 4 is uh, of relevance, as this deals with taxable earnings from UK resident employees. And that specific provision, uh, which we'll come to, is uh, in Sections 14 and 15. In fact, we may as well turn to now. Section 14 is at page 31 of the Authorities Bundle. and under the heading taxable earnings under this chapter introduction, 
Uh, it spells out that the chapter sets what the taxable earnings are from employment, where section 15 applies to general earnings. Section 15 then, uh, over the page at page 32, it sets out what the earnings are for a year where an employee is UK resident, which in this case the respondent and the other officers obviously were. And it's 15.2 that uh, is of significance in that it refers to the full amount of any general earnings, uh, which are those referred to in section 15.1, uh, being an amount of taxable earnings from the employment. And it follows in, in my submission that what is intended here is that which is on the page, that the full amount of earnings earned by a UK resident uh, employee uh, from the employment are taxable earnings. It's well, that begs the question say, of what's meant by general earnings, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, so you maybe. don't get any further with that argument. Uh, obviously, once you fall within the definition of general earnings, the whole of that is taxable. But it doesn't answer the question of what's meant by profit for the purposes of the definition of general earnings. No, but it, my lady, it does have to do with whether it's from the employment. And yes. So if the payment is from the employment, because of the yes. width of those words, we say that they are intended to be wide to capture um, all earnings that might uh, be occasioned. So whilst profit, it, whilst it may not help influence the understanding of the word profit, the word profit needs to be looked at in the context of these provisions to understand what taxable earnings are. Yeah. Uh, that's not the end of the, 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 the matter, though, because having identified what taxable earnings are, a very elaborate piece of legislation, having identified what taxable earnings are, it's designed to be the full amount of earnings received in a tax year. There remains the calculation referred to in section 9.2, namely that what proportion of the full amount is net taxable earnings. And the calculation is set out in section 11 uh, on page 30. This is the method by which Parliament has described the method of calculating the net taxable earnings from employment. And one sees here TE means the total amount of any taxable earnings from the employment. And DE means the total amount of any deduction allowed from those earnings under the provisions listed in section 327 sub 3 to 5. The importance of uh, this provision, uh, in my submission, is that it contemplates all earnings from the employment being taxable earnings, uh, only subject to deduction. So, my lord, my lord, the point you raised before, it's on the one side it's the credit, and the other side it's the debit. Uh, and at the moment we're firmly trying to work out how you get to what comes into the charge within section 9. We're trying to work out what comes in on the credit side. Precisely. And there may or may not be a debit if that's permitted by sections 327, 3 to 5. Yes. And uh, your point essentially is, well, Parliament's decided what's deductible, you shouldn't go around inventing new deductions. Precisely. Uh, finally, to yeah. round out the legislative analysis, can I invite you to turn to page 46, please? Which is the 327 provision. It comes uh, in a part dealing with employment income deductions allowed from earnings. Sorry, give us the reference again, please. Forgive me, my lady. It's page 46. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Seven. Yes, thank you. Uh, a section referred to in the definition of net taxable earnings in section 11. So in 3271, it provides for dedu deductions that are allowed from the taxable earnings from the employment in calculating the net taxable, uh, the net tax earnings from the employment. It's important not to overlook 3272 because this slightly modifies uh, the definition. Uh, references to earnings, now earnings would otherwise be defined in section 62, from which deductions are allowed are references to the taxable earnings mentioned in subsection 1. Then at 3273, it provides for the deductions which are permitted. 
and it's common ground as I understand it that none of the deductions apply here as well. Turning over two pages now, uh, if you please, it's page 48. And it provides for uh, income from which deductions may be made and sets out what is described as the general rule, which is that deductions are allowed from any earnings from the employment in question and not from earnings from any other employment. And the reference to earnings, as I say, must be read in line of 3272A. and it provides for expenses paid by an employee and provides the circumstances in which a deduction from a person's earnings per amount is allowed. And the provision must be read alongside section 336, which we'll come to. Uh, before we do, section 334, sub 2, this on page 51, dealing with reimbursement of an expense. And it makes clear uh, at 3342 that the deduction of a reimbursement may only be allowed if it is uh, included in the person's earnings, uh, meaning the taxable earnings. I said I would come back to it at section 336 on page 52 now. And this deals with the general rule for deduction. So you only deduct a reimbursement if you if you if the amount that is reimbursed appears on the credit side, then the reimbursement can appear on the debit side. Yes. So if so is that the provision? that applies to the part of the settlement agreement in this case, which was ascribed as being for costs? My lady, no. Um, and th this is where the upper tribunal's analysis at the end of its decision um, is, we say, faulty. Because the reason that it's not included is because it's not from earnings. It's I follow. It, it's from the litigation. It, it, it's very much as Judge Brannan says at paragraph 54 of his decision. It's from something else. So it is It is more than you're getting, and it's from something else. It's from the litigation. But it's not, it's not a payment for services. No. It's a payment for something else. Precisely. And just to be clear, if this had been structured differently, so that the success fee were carved out in the same way as the agreed costs, would that have been from something else? My Lord, the, the question that you asked is the same one that Judge Brannan asked me at first instance. And the answer is, it's difficult to say. And the reason for that is that it may be that a taxpayer might carve out the success fee in the insurance premium and, and put them under a heading that says agreed costs. But the revenue aren't a party to this agreement. They would be entitled to look through the agreement to work out which amounts are earnings and which amounts are not. And so it may be that even if the agreement had been structured differently, that it would still be, it, the, the, the payment itself would still have attracted the character of earnings because that was the reason for its payment. And so it doesn't really matter then how the parties describe what that payment is. If it's earnings, it's always going to be earnings in my opinion. Well, I understand the point you make about you don't look at the labels that are attached by third parties because the revenue is not bound by them. You look at the substance. But what is the substantial difference between legal costs and a success fee and an uplift? Because the success fee and the insurance premium are monies paid out of the earnings. So when Why the, the, the costs are paid out of the earnings? No, because the settlement in the agreement itself, the global settlement sum was settlement sum plus agreed cost. All right, so it, de it depends, therefore, on whether you're in substance rather than in yes. labelling, 
Uh, if the deal that is struck is one in which there is a sum in respect of lost income, or earnings, or damages, or whatever, uh, and that is properly labelled as coming from the employment, it's taxable on your case. If, on the other hand, uh, you have something which could be the success fee, and there is an extra payment in respect of that, which is nothing to do with the the lump sum relating to the earnings, yeah. it's not because it's not from the earn it's not from the um, well, it's not from that, from that, that, on that analysis. I, I suspect the answer is yes. Yes. So when you're settling, <laughs> you have to be extra careful to make sure that on your analysis no part of the money which is coming into the claimant who's successfully settling um, to which the payment from his solicitors will attach is in substance compensation for his loss of earnings because the minute that it's compensation for his loss of earnings from his employment it's taxable my lady, yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. I think we were just about to deal with uh, section 336, um, the general rule for deductions from expenses, uh, and you'll see uh, what no doubt is a, a familiar rule to this court. Um, obliged to incur and pay the expense of the holder of the employment, and the amount must be wholly exclusively and necessarily in the performance of duties of the employment. Standing back from these provisions in the, the legislative pathway that we've been looking at, um, in my submission, what ITIPA does is two things. Uh, the first is to identify whether a payment is taxable earnings from the employment. And secondly, if it is, and if there are allowable deductions, they can be claimed so long as they have been included as part of the taxable earnings. The employee was obliged to incur and pay the expenses of the employment, and that the amount was wholly exclusively and necessarily incurred in the performance of those duties. And it's really, in my submission, only the first of these issues uh, which is relevant, as this was never really a case, in my submission, about allowable deductions. Agreed it, indeed, it was agreed that these weren't allowable deductions. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a case about whether they were wholly, necessarily, exclusively incurred. Yeah. And once that is appreciated, and once the statutory context yeah. of Section 62 is properly understood, it is we submit uh, a Clear, clear as it can be, that it is a provision designed to capture the total amount of earnings from employment, and in this case, the whole settlement sum was earnings. That's why it was being paid. That was the character of the payment. Your analysis would hold good, would it not? Not just in um, an employment, directly employment-related case. But, for example, in relation to the earnings related, future earnings related aspects of compensation in a personal injuries claim. In, in the sense that if you were claiming for personal injuries in the workplace? No. Um, if, you, if you have a claim for personal injuries, mm. um, then uh, if somebody is really badly injured, they may not be able to work. And there will be potentially an element of compensation by way of damages to uh, deal with that contingency, yes. the loss of your future earnings. Now that's usually subject to a fairly complex calculation, yes. um, uh, which involves um, taking into consideration before you get to a net sum the fact that you would pay tax on those earnings. So the tax will come off the earnings um, it never actually goes into the pocket of the revenue because what you're getting back are damages. But I'm just looking at the into potential. Into the pocket of the revenue or the individual? 
it don't get into neither because me. because yeah. it never actually gets paid to anybody yes. it's, it's just taken off on the basis that the individual would never get it yes. they'd get a net earning um, and would have to account for that tax to the revenue yes. so so the money comes out I'm just thinking about the ramifications of that and whether there are any uh, in terms of your um, your argument because it would mean that there might be a difference in well, you wouldn't be wouldn't be earning wouldn't be money from employment because ex hypothesis you can't work. That's why it's paid. True, um, that might be the answer. Well, then, that in, in that case, my lady, I, I adopt my lord's answer. Um, <laughs> the question. Not convinced yet, but I mean, I, I, my lord may may well be right. Very grateful. I, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud because um, your analysis could have ramifications beyond. This scenario, my lady, I, uh, you, uh, and you know, I'm alive to the potential for the impact that it might have on DPAs and settlements, as well as the strengths and merits of the of the direct case on tax. I take entirely on board what you're saying about credits and debits and so on. My lady, the the, the very point that you've raised with respect is is why the application for permission to appear was drafted in quite the terms it was. Now, the upper tribunal said it, it didn't think it had the ramifications, but it, in my submission, this could be uh, quite a, a difficult issue. Yes. Uh, if the respondent uh, is correct, we, we say on our analysis that when one looks at it across the board, yeah. if it's earnings, it's a relatively straightforward analysis. If it's from the employment, it's taxable earnings, and it can be brought into the charge but what one must always do is go and look at the reason for the payment. Uh, and if the reason for the payment is that it's taxable, earn it is that it's being paid for earnings from employment, then that may rather circumscribe some of the more uh, difficult elements that, that one might imagine. Can I just understand what the ramifications might be? I mean, we're concerned simply with the meaning of profit. Um, if an employee receives salary, wages, fee, gratuity, none of this arises. So what sorts of payment might we be concerned with beyond the facts of this case? One, one example that um, uh, my learned junior and I have been uh, discussing was uh, whether in the context of an employee-employer relationship. Now there's obviously high authority for the proposition that one can't deduct um, dry cleaning purchase of seats. Now, if an employer was to say to an employee, I require you, it's necessary, you're obliged to wear a suit that's clean. The employee then goes out, buys a suit, makes sure it's always dry clean. You couldn't claim that as a deduction. The authorities say you can't. But in that scenario, you would then the, the employer topping up the let's say two hundred pounds to make sure that you can cover the cost of the suit and the dry cleaning would then have to work out whether it was necessarily incurred if it was a profit from the employment and if it was then on the upper tribunal's analysis one could get by the back door what it can't through the front and just to understand how this fits together um, we find specific provisions dealing with expenses. Um, so if the employer is paying the £200 in respect of dry cleaning expenses, do you have to worry about whether it's profit or not? That, that's part of the complication, because the employer would then possibly need to see receipts and then work out, uh, when it's doing its own tax returns for the revenue, working out uh, PAYE on those payments, whether it was necessarily incurred, because if it was and it was a profit, then on the after tribunal's analysis you could deduct it. So it, it, it does create uh, some uh, unforeseen uh, difficulties in my So opinion. wait a minute, on, so on your case, the employer simply taxes the £200 because it's paid to the employee, and then there's an argument about whether it's deductible or not. Well, the, no, in fact, on the upper tribunal's analysis, my lord. Now follow. On yeah. your on your that, your analysis yes. says the employer 
simply taxes the £200, but, you say, on the upper tribunal's analysis, the employer's got a rather more difficult task, and that is to work out whether it was necessary for the employee to dry clean the suit in order to do the job. Exactly. Uh, and then, of course, the, the kind of secondary point, possibly secondary point, maybe not, um, of you've managed to achieve something via the word profit that you couldn't achieve via the deduction system. Yeah. Okay. Can I just try to understand how it fits together a bit more? Um, so we assume for the sake of argument, the employer requires the employee to get their suits dry cleaned and the employer pays the employee £200 a year or whatever yes. to allow for that. Um, now, if I, if I go on from section 62, we get to section 70. Yes. Um, so that applies to sum paid to an employee if the sum is paid to the employee in respect of expenses. So would that catch the £200? Uh, it, it, it's difficult to say because it, it would depend on the context of whether you were it was necessary for the purposes of um, performing the duty, the, the, the work. Well, if it was a uniform, let's suppose it's not a suit, but it's um, a uniform you have to wear in a factory for health and safety reasons. So you've got to go out and buy your uniform. The employer doesn't provide you with one. You've got to go and buy it, and the employer gives you some money to um, cover the costs of that. That's a closer analogy, isn't it? Yes. And there, there, there is an authority, and it, it's referred to in one of the decisions, and um, it will come to me, uh, where it was found to be, in that type of scenario, it was found to be an emolument of the employment. And so it had to be included in the, in the earnings, in effect. Um, now, what I don't know, can check is whether it was reimbursed to some extent. But you'd um, expect it to be. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't yeah, under I, I, circumstances well, yeah, I, I because you couldn't it. do the job without it. No, I, I would expect it to be. Um, but I, I just want to double check that before I commit myself mm. to, to an answer. But my expectation is that based on the operation of section seventy that it would likely be. So just following up my Lord's question, section seventy starts this chapter applies. What does this chapter do? What is mm. what is this chapter? This chapter is well, tax, tax law benefits, expense payments. So these expenses go in on the credit side, do they? Or are they being excluded from the credit side? Uh, these are being... My Lord, this is part of the benefits code, so yes. these amounts are treated as, uh, as mm -hmm. earnings under the benefits code. Yes. Right, so... Hello, friend is right. So these are treated as earnings? Yes. Yeah. And, and that... that I assume follows from section 72. So if you have sums in respect of expenses, they're treated as earnings. My Lord, yes. Um, and in the case as, of, as long as they're from the employment. As long as they're from the employment. Yes. Um, so if the employer is paying the £200, that's from the employment, uh, and uh, it goes in on the credit side. Um, but if the statute specifically says that, why, in that context, do we have to worry about the meaning of profit? Because if, it, if the amount is characterised not as salary wages B, and you're dealing with whether it's a profit from the employment, and, and the taxpayer comes on and says this was profit from the employment, relying specifically on what's been said by the upper tribunal in this case, uh, it, would, um, it would create um, a kind of secondary calculation at that stage in the analysis. So it would be the taxable earnings less the calculation that you undertake for profit, less deduction. And why would the revenue need to rely on the word profit? Why couldn't they just say, well, Section 72, that answers it? Yes, well, in practice they might. But the, 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 the analysis that we, or the, the hypothetical that we've tried to um, identify is one where it might slip through the, fall through the, the gaps in effect. And what I'm, what I'm then worried about is is there a situation that really slips through the, the, the gaps, or, or is the answer simply to be found in section 72? If you have um, uh, a sum paid in respect of an expense, well, you don't worry about whether it's profit or not, it's just added in under section 72. Well, that, that might very well be the case. Um, what we say, though, is that the analysis adopted by the upper tribunal creates a situation where there are potentially unforeseen consequences. And that's part of the difficulty.
the revenue have with the way in which it has been um, reasoned by the upper tribunal. Because instead of it being, uh, as I mentioned earlier, quite a, a, a tightly constricted piece of legislation, by creating a uh, effectively an internal calculation built into the word profit mm -hmm. can have unforeseen consequences. And so our, our submission is um, the up tribunal is wrong and, and, and we don't need to get into some of these more broad um, discussions at all, in fact, if it's kept to what we say it should be kept to, uh, in my submission. So you say this is sort of intended to be a comprehensive code which deals with credits and debits? Yeah. And in fact, we, we, we do say that, that is very much the start and the end point, uh, and the upper tribunal in, in its analysis has, has simply gone well beyond that ordinary, quite routine in my submission, start and end point. The Upper Tribunal has, has arrived at this conclusion, or, 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 or this position, through uh, what we say is uh, an erroneous reliance on these reimbursement type cases, because that's really where, an expense type cases, because that really is where one sees the type of language that's deployed by the Upper Tribunal when dealing with whether it's from the employment or not. Uh, and one sees that in the Upper Tribunal's decision between paragraphs 54 and 64, uh, where it talks about the profit issue. Um, and it, it's dealing at, at this point in the um, decision with the other cases at which we're going to come on to in a little more detail. So just before we get to the profit issue, um, at Paragraph 39, from the form issue, they say they adopt what was said in Hume and Nagel. Yes. Do they actually decide the form issue? Well, Lord, no. It, it, it seems that between 37 and 39, the upper tribunal summarises the authorities. And in fact, my Lord's preempted by submission, which is to say that we don't even necessarily disagree with the analysis that comes between um, 37 and 39 about whether something is from the employment. It's when the upper tribunal embarks upon its analysis of the profit issue, which is where the, the errors come in. Because having started in, in what may be the right place, reliance upon the right authorities, talking about whether it, something is from the employment, it then descends into uh, an analysis of what the word profit means, um, rather than effectively ending the, ending the decision, as Judge Brannan did, cutting through it all by saying, this is just earnings. Um, can I invite you to turn to paragraph 28 on page 85 of the core bundle, which is where the upper tribunal sets out the basis of Mr Murphy's appeal. Sorry, which page? Uh, 85, my lord. In dealing with the appeal, it, 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 the Upper Tribunal did touch on a number of different aspects uh, of the grounds, but it really did only deal with um, ground two. And this much is, is noted by the Upper Tribunal itself at paragraph 86 of the decision. Uh, and in those circumstances, the primary issue it appears to have considered was whether the FTT erred in not having regard to comments of Lord Denning and Hoxtrust to the effect that a payment to an employee in respect of a liability incurred in consequence of his employment, did not give rise to a profit for the employee. And it, it, it may be that the upper tribunal in, in adopting or summarising this point, using the words in consequence of, has led itself into error because it's not using the statutory language of from the employment. The upper tribunal then goes on, as uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison has uh, pointed out, broken the issue down into two points. The first being the from issue, and the second being the profit issue. And the profit issue, it, we, we see that at uh, 
paragraph 32, 1 on page 86, and 32, uh, 2 on page 87. In respect of the first of these questions, as I say, the upper tribunal likely adopted uh, a correct starting point dealing with the, the correct cases, but then went on to focus on this issue about uh, profit, uh, whether it was from the employment or from a non-employment source. And it, it really is uh, the, the second issue where we say the upper tribunal, with great respect, did just go wrong. Uh, in dealing with uh, our grounds, I intend to group grounds one, two, and four together. They seem to me to be conveniently grouped that way. Uh, and to start that analysis, we should probably start with uh, the decision of Eagles and Levy, which is where the upper tribunal started when it uh, engaged in its analysis, analysis rather, of the profit issue. Um, and at paragraph 42, we see there the uh, of the UT's decision. The first uh, is the decision of Finley J in Eagles. And then the upper tribunal commences its exposition of Eagles. Uh, and the proposition they take from it is set out, in, or proposition they take from it is set out at paragraphs 47 and 48 on page 90. In the upper tribunal, I say we agree with Mr. Collins. There is an assumption behind Finley James' reasoning and his finding that costs were not part of the settlement sum, namely that if they were, that amount would not have been taxable. If they were taxable as part of the settlement sum, there would have been no need to make that factual finding. In our view, it's implicit in the reasoning of Finley Jane Eagles that it is the net sum after costs have been deducted that is taxable. If the taxpayer had received an amount in respect of his costs, uh, important word there, his costs, but had been necessarily obliged to pay the costs in order to receive the settlement sum, he would not have been paid. Or he would not have paid tax on that amount, and that's quite crucial in my submission because when we come to Eagles and Levy in a moment, in my submission, this is just wrong uh, by reference to the facts of that case. With that in mind, can I invite the uh, court to turn, please, to... But before we get there... My lady, yes. Um, if he'd received an amount that was dedicated to his costs, which were independent and couldn't be said in any way to represent damages, which would otherwise have been monies paid to him in respect to the services he rendered to his employer, it wouldn't satisfy the From test, and therefore it wouldn't have been taxable anyway. My lady, we, we may be able to touch on that uh, point in this case. And so if I, if I might address you at the end of the yes. if that's uh, of course. okay. At page uh, 82, uh, this is where Eagles and Levy starts. And it's necessary to look before going to the decision of Finley J uh, at what the General Purpose Commissioners did. Uh, and Mr. Lee, the, the facts can be said quite shortly. Mr. Levy appealed to the General Purpose Commissioners against three assessments uh, comprising. Sir Alfred, I think. Sir Alfred, I'm very grateful, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Alfred uh, appealed to the General Purpose Commissioners. I think you can tell I'm probably Australian, and uh, we don't we don't really deal with this. <laughs> Sir Alfred uh, appealed. Al Al Albert. Albert, sorry, got his name wrong. Sir Albert. Yeah. We'll, we'll get there in the end. <laughs> Uh, appealed to the General Purpose Commissioners against three assessments, uh, comprising some said to be an emolument uh, as chairman and managing director of the tobacco company. Um, this was a position that he'd held for a number of, of uh, years. And uh, Sir Albert was uh, to receive 20% of the annual profits subject to deductions, i.e. deducting all expenses excluding income tax and losses and provisions for depreciation of outstanding trade obligations. Um, the company terminated the appointment uh, by consent uh, in 1930, so about four years uh, after his original uh, appointment. 
and Sir Albert received a computation of the amount of remuneration he was entitled to for the final six month period uh, of the appointment as chairman. He contended that the paid sum was inadequate and commenced a claim in the Chancery Division. He said that there were three items that amounted to more than £300,000 that should not have been deducted from the annual profits when determining the final payment of the six-month uh, period. On the second day of trial, a settlement was reached, and, and we see this at paragraph uh, 9 uh, on page 85 of the decision. Uh, and that agreement was announced in court by counsel, uh, and the nature of that agreement I'll come back to in a moment. The General Purpose Commissioners heard evidence from Sir Albert's solicitor about the Chancery Division proceedings and made findings of fact, uh, again on page 85, paragraph 10. The General Purpose Commissioners accepted, and we can see that uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, that... <coughs> the matter of a possible settlement of the action had been discussed by the witness, that's the solicitor, the respondent, that being Sir Albert, and uh, his counsel before the action came on for trial, and it had then been decided that the adequacy of any offer the company might make was to determine by the figure remaining after discharge of the said costs and expenses, which were then and there estimated at £5,000. Having explained uh, that the offer by the company of 45000 was accepted, in fact the costs turned out to be, and we see this uh, uh, over the page at paragraph 11, the costs turned out to be £6,466, which were the costs and expenses uh, Sir Albert was put to paying his lawyers in recovering the remuneration under the agreement. Uh, Sir Albert's arguments are then set out at paragraph 12, and it's suggested that the three assessments, and, and, and you might notice the echoes of some of the arguments that are being put by either side in this case, that the three assessments should be reduced to the agreed sum less costs incurred by him in establishing his claim to the payment of the agreed sum. Tax should be charged on profits of office without the costs and expenses, which were proper deductions to be made in determining the amount of the assessable profits. Sir Albert had been necessarily obliged to incur and defray the costs in order to obtain payment of the remuneration due to him. And finally, that the settlement sum was to cover and include the respondent's claim for remuneration and his costs and expenses and the costs and expenses, or alternatively the costs and expenses as between party and party, were not assessable. The inspector of taxes then, uh, the, the argument from the inspector of taxes is then set out at uh, paragraph 13, and in particular the settlement sum should be paid as a comprehensive sum, and there were no costs either side, i.e. Sir Albert had to pay for his own action. The agreement which was announced before the court, and this is where I said I'd come back to, we see on the next page, uh, page 87, under the heading Exhibit C. Very distinguished counsel. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, my <Lord. laughs> um, And we see uh, here, uh, and if one reads the, the, the settlement, that there were no costs on either side of the matter. And that's made clear yeah. at the bottom. And if, if one starts, in fact, ten lines up towards the end of the sentence, starting in those circumstances, if I could invite the court to read that uh, and over the page as well. Yeah, so it includes everything, and then over the page he says, the sum is a comprehensive sum, there are no costs on either side. Yes. Accordingly, we, we submit there were no inter-parties costs uh, in this case. That's clear from no costs either side. Perhaps in modern day language, each party bears their own. Um, I, I, importantly, we say nothing is said here about his own legal costs and the sums Mr. Lee, uh, Sir Albert, had uh, paid to his representative. The General Purpose Commissioners 
then found, and we see this at one page back at paragraph 14, uh, that the settlement sum should have his own legal costs removed from the settlement sum of £45,000, which necessarily reduced the level of the assessment. We see there the reference to £6,466. The inspector uh, appealed, and it came before Justice Finlay, Mr Justice Finlay, in a form which his lordship describes at the outset on page 88 as a little troublesome and a little unsatisfactory. Uh, this was because the general purpose commissioners had failed to indicate which of the reasons advanced by uh, Sir Albert that uh, they <coughs> were accepting, uh, in essence, or rejecting in respect of the inspector. <coughs> Importantly, in my submission, is at page 89, next to the uh, first blue sidelining, uh, His Lordship rejected the contention that uh, Sir Albert was necessarily obliged to incur the costs in order to obtain the payment of remuneration, and therefore it was not deductible. That was the starting point uh, by uh, Mr Justice Finlay. His Lordship also rejected the settlement sum as including costs because it was expressly said no that there were no costs either side. If we then turn to page 90 uh, of the authorities volume. And it's uh, at the base of the second blue uh, sidelining, the sentence starting, I think that when one reads. And if I could invite you to read that and over the page, please. We place particular reliance uh, at page 90 uh, on, the, on the passage about substantial costs that he would be let in for. So in effect, it's noted that Sir Albert was going to be paying the costs, his own legal costs, out of the £45,000 settlement. follow that because part of the settlement sum was not earmarked uh, specifically or substantively uh, as a payment for the costs, uh, it was to be taken that the whole of the settlement sum represented compensation for his uh, earnings and therefore was taxable. Precisely, my lady. Yeah. One thing I haven't identified, the judge says twice that he's prepared to accept the test which Sir Simmons has put to him, but I haven't actually worked out what the test is. Have you identified that? It, it, I have to say it's not uh, necessarily easy to detect. In my submission, it, it, it's likely that it reiterates what was said below, which is why I referred the, the court to paragraph 13, uh, 1 to 4 at page 86. Um, but what, what is clear in my submission um, is that, bearing in mind what the upper tribunal uh, has found at paragraphs 47 and 48, um, namely that, um, that the taxpayer had received an amount in respect of his costs, but he had been necessarily obliged to pay the costs in order to receive the settlement sum. He would not have paid tax on that amount. I, I think that the test that Mr Simmons was arguing for is on page 30 of the report, page 89 of our Bible, next to the second blue-lined part. I'm prepared to accept the test which Mr Simmons put to me. I'm prepared to consider whether there was any evidence upon which the commissioners could
right? So I think what Mr. Simmons is saying is that that was a question of fact for the general commissioners. Uh, you judge can only reverse it on what would now be called Edwards and Bearstow grounds. Yep. And um, that's why when he comes to deal with the point at 32, um, he says, accepting the point which Mr. Simmons put me, and taking as I do the view this was a question of fact, mm -hmm. I arrive at the conclusion on materials they could arrive at only one conclusion. So that yes. is a sort of classic Edwards and Bearstow type interference with the finding of fact which it wasn't open to the commissioners to make yeah. I think that's how I read it, it, it look my lord it, it, it may be um, I had rather read the, the paragraph disjunctively the, the one that's at uh, paragraph 89 but I, I can readily see why that would be a, a better analysis of, of the uh, paragraph um, but what is clear in my submission from this decision is that Justice Finlay could see that there were legal costs coming out of that 45000 yeah. that he himself was going to have to pay, but that didn't change his view uh, that uh, they were taxable. They were effectively, the legal costs were being paid away out of that sum of 45000 but that didn't change the character of the 45000 itself. Well, it's, it's straightforward. If, if you receive by way of compensation, um, something which is the equivalent of what you would have earned, um, that money would always be taxable in your hands um, if you'd received it at the right time, if you'd been paid it during, during your employment. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, the only justification you might have for saying you shouldn't have to pay tax on it is either if it's not proper, properly referable to your employment, that's the from tax. Yeah or if it's an allowable deduction under the statutory provisions for a, a, a setting off against the, the credit side, as my Lord puts it. Yeah. So um, if it doesn't fall within either, and, and Sir Albert um, fell foul on the deduction side of it, um, then I suppose the moral of the story is you've got to be very careful how you structure your settlements, but um, that's neither here nor there. No. If, you, if you structure them in this particular way, as Sir Albert did, then the consequences are that it doesn't matter that you've got to pay part of your damages to somebody else. Um, it's, um, that's a necessary consequence of having to uh, fund lawyers. Uh, and my lady, the, the, the last part of your um, observation, uh, I think, in my submission, is um, helpful in this sense, that they were dealing with costs here. So yes. That, whereas in the case before this court is in fact dealing with earnings that he is paying away. So the character is, is, is unpaid earnings, whereas in Eagles and uh, Levy, it was cost. And so what, what might be said right, to be a slightly... That. Yeah, okay. Eagles, don't but, but, understand that. Eagles and Levy, Sir Albert was getting what he should have got as remuneration yes. and paying mm -hmm. part of it away as costs. Yes. And here... Uh, Mr. Murphy is getting part of which he should have got as remuneration and paying part of it away in success fee and insurance premium. But the character of what's being paid away is different. Uh, in, in the sense that, it, right. in this case, in my submission, it's, it's slightly worse for the taxpayer in the sense that it's damages being paid away uh, to satisfy a liability rather than the cost. It, it, it may not, ma it may not sure, matter much sure in the final wash up. Follow the no, distinction. No. Well, uh, it, it may be that it's a bad point. And if, if it is. I, mean, I, I understand that the difference between the agreed costs and the success fee and insurance is that the agreed costs are not from employment. Yeah. That's why you say they're not taxable. Yeah. And that, I mean, the upper tribunal seems to have elided that by mm. saying that you can't distinguish. That, 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 that is it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, and as I say, perhaps my, my point is a bad one. But whatever the position, um, in my submission, Eagles and Levy is much closer to, to this case uh, than the upper tribunal's analysis of it at paragraphs 47 and 48. I mean, you, you also may well have problems on the upper tribunal's analysis if the amount which you deduct by way of costs, let's suppose it was a 
Levy type case are more than might have been allowed on a cost assessment. Then what do you do? Well, we're still not from employment, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard luck. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a Levy, in a Levy type case. Yes. Um, anyway. mm. um, but, but, uh, I mean, the, the upper tribunal uses the word necessarily. But if you are leaving aside the provisions dealing with deduction and simply working out what is profit, it's not clear that necessarily would come into it. No, no, my lord. No, that's why uh, earlier this morning I, I said that it may, in the when it all comes out in the wash, the fact that it was necessarily incurred or otherwise may not matter uh, at the end of the day. What what matters is whether it was from the employment. Mm. In that sense, if. Sir Albert had to pay his lawyers so much money, it doesn't really matter whether he necessarily had to pay them or not. The fact is, his net gain was reduced by what he had to pay. Yes. 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 But it's the net ga it's the gain that was taxable. Yes, it was the full 45,000. It was the full 45,000 because that represented what he would otherwise have been paid, um, or a, 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 a portion of it. Um, it was what he was claiming. Basically, he's claiming for unpaid wages or salary or equivalent of emoluments from his employment, and that's what he got. Uh, and he couldn't escape the consequences of that being taxable, as it would have been if it had been paid at the right time, by the fact that he had to pay some of it away to his lawyers. My lady, yes. Really, that's the bottom line. Uh, and in fact, that's why potentially the evidence of the solicitor about the fact that the adequacy of the damages took into account the fact that the costs were going to be paid, they had to reach a particular level. Uh, and that echoes what happened in this case. Yes. Uh, you, you will have seen the original offer of four million yes. increased by two hundred thousand to take because of the tax, tax consequences. Yes. Um, and now the, the the taxpayers say, well, please don't tax the full amount. Yeah. Um, that gets the merits point out of the way. <laughs> I'm very grateful. <laughs> the uh, turning now to the uh, the next decision the upper tribunal look at, which is Hochstrasser. Uh, and it's, it's characterised at paragraph 76 of the Upper Tribunal's decision, perhaps, curiously, as a reimbursement case. Um, but it's at tab 12, page 103. It starts at page, uh, page 92, but we're going to start at page 103. Yeah. Uh, this is the speech of uh, the first speech by Count Simons. He states the facts, which are at the all note uh, at page uh, 93. But in essence, uh, Mr. Mays was employed by ICI Chemicals. He agreed to employment with ICI anywhere in the United Kingdom, and ICI should be at liberty to change the locality of that employment uh, within those limits. Uh, if he had to change his residence, ICI said they would pay him removal and other expenses incidental thereto. And they should be uh, should consider fair and reasonable in the circumstances. Having entered into that service agreement, and that's quite important, the service agreement, Mr. May has entered into a second agreement whereby ICI assisted uh, their married employees to purchase a house uh, for their own occupation. And the stated purpose of the scheme, which is set out at uh, page 96 of the authorities, but it's the your note was that a man being transferred resulted in domestic upheaval and therefore a man might be less willing to buy a house if he were worried that he might make a loss if he had to sell a house, uh, which would then uh, make him discontent with his working uh, arrangement. And therefore to avoid the, quote, possible financial embarrassment, the housing agreement was operated to indemnify him against that loss. However, it, the, the indemnity couldn't operate until such time as uh, it was first offered to ICI uh, as a house that they could purchase, or it was in fact sold for less money than it was purchased for. Uh, this meant that they could not make a profit out of the housing agreement, uh, is the way it was put. Ultimately, Mr. Mays did buy a house uh, with a total value of £1,850, uh, and ICI provided £300 uh, free of interest uh, on the second mortgage. 
it was ultimately sold for £1,500, which resulted in a £350 uh, loss, at all, at an amount needing to be credited to Mr. Mills. And the £350 was taxed. At the bottom of page 103, we see Viscount Simons uh, adopting the words of Mr uh, Justice Upjohn. And I invite you to read the last two sentences and then over the page next to the sideline in blue. said uh, in my submission in this paragraph is that to be a profit arising from the employment, the payment must be made in reference to the services uh, that the employee renders by virtue of that office. And in, in the nature of a reward for those services. Precisely. My lady. Um, at page 105, uh, his lordship uh, went on um, uh, dealing towards the bottom of the page, next to the red, red sidelining, there is nothing expressed or implicit in the agreement which suggests the payment is a reward for services except the single fact of the relationship uh, of the parties. The uh, agreement being the housing. The housing, housing precisely. Agreement. Precisely. So it's, it's the, the second agreement, which is the one that's being considered yeah. here. And um, uh, uh, Before we move on, actually, just above that, uh, above the sidelining, 13 lines, the, the sentence starting, thus in the present case, it is for the Crown to establish that a payment made under the housing agreement is a reward for the employee's services. Yeah. So that, that, that's a clear reference there to it being from the housing agreement rather than the employment yeah. or yes. services agreement. And then, it, then he, in, later on in that paragraph he says, nevertheless it, that is the Crown, is driven to the argument that a payment made under it, that is the housing agreement, is a reward for services and, and nothing else. else. Yes. So that's the argument the Crown is deploying. Precisely. <laughs> uh, at the bottom of sorry, at the bottom of 105, the final few words, this is at uh, this at once suggests that there is some other reason for the payment than services rendered or to be rendered. This is a reference again to the housing agreement uh, before um, turning towards the bottom of the, the last third of the page next to the uh, italicised quote of Reed and Herbert McQuaid I do not doubt that a taxable profit may take the form of the discharge of an employee's obligations as well as of a direct payment and that uh, in my submission uh, is important in this case because that is what uh, has the discharge of the success fee and the insurance premium out of the employment sum, or the, the unpaid earnings. And I'm not sure this case really helps mm. one way or the other, um, other than the fact that uh, it's a case on from. Uh, and uh, on the facts of that case, um, the from test wasn't met. Uh, my lady, precisely. Um, but when reliance is placed by the upper tribunal uh, and, and is urged on this court uh, by the respondent that this authority is the one from which you derive net, uh, net gross profit benefit or an overall benefit, one must, in my submission, look at the context in which yes, it arises. Um, but my lady has the point. Uh, we, we say this is simply not what the case was uh, attempting to resolve. 
Yeah. Well, I think Mr. Collins likes what Lord Denning had to say. Yes. Um, Page one one two. Yes, I was going. Uh, just wondering whether uh, my lords and my lady may need assistance with some of the other speeches, but I, I'm happy to go straight to Lord Denning's if, if you prefer. Well, we've, I got, mean, we've got Lord Radcliffe at the top of page 108 saying it's accessible if it's been paid to him in return for acting as or being an employee. Uh, he says at three at uh, 109 at the end, don't find any qualification the principal an employee who pays an employee's personal bills as part of his reward for services is paying a taxable wage. <coughs> Yes, my, my lord, they all say the same, uh, in variously different ways, but yeah. they all say the same in my yeah. And then we come to Lord Denning. To Lord Denning. Um, and his lordship suggests that Mr Mays did not make a profit from the employment, and he suggested that if the employer had, by way of reward of services, agreed to indemnify the employee for the losses on the stock exchange, we see this at, at the bottom of 112, uh, those payments would be taxable. And then turning over the page to 113, it was said that because the losses were his own affair and nothing, that would be because the losses were his own affair and nothing to do with the employment. His Lordship found the losses were a straightforward reward for service. The test which his Lordship preferred was to simply ask whether the £350 received by Mr Mays was a profit from his employment. He said that it wasn't because it wasn't remuneration or reward or return for his services in any sense of the word, the way it's put. Yes. But, and, and it's, it's obviously this speech which the upper tribunal has latched onto as being in support of their analysis at uh, paragraph 53. Um, and before we, 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 we finish with uh, what I say about Lord Denning, at paragraph 53 of the upper tribunal's decision, uh, on page 91, it states, later cases tend to refer to the judgments of other members of the House of Lords without reference to Lord Denning's speech. However, uh, we agree with Mr Collins that Lord Denning's focus on the actual profits the employee made from the payment and his distinction between a payment made by way of compensation for losses incurred in consequence of the employee's employment and payment made to compensate an employee for losses which were his own affair and nothing to do with his employment, is instructive. Although Lord Denning did not address the issue in terms of whether the measure of profit was gross or net, he was clear on the facts of the case that there was no profit <coughs> at all. Well, that's just a complete misreading of what Lord Denning says. Well, my lady, precisely. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't read this passage in Lord Denning as being any different from what his brother judges have said, which is, it's not from... Mm. Uh, it's not a profit from his employment it, and the, the, the focus is on from you've then got that little bit of the passage about what um, is meant to be the profits of the employment at, at, at the um, end of paragraph um, at second paragraph on 397 yes um, but that was as a result of the way in which the case was being argued as suggesting that something which was not uh, remuneration for services rendered under the agreement could fall within the the category of what was taxable so it was an attempt by the revenue in that case to expand what was meant by profit rather than any sort of reference to net or, or gross right. uh, and, and if, I think you get that from what Lord Denning says right at the end of his speech my, my lord's beaten me to the punch yeah. <laughs> so the question simply is was this £350 received by Mr Mays a profit from his employment I think not for the simple reason it was not a remuneration or reward or return for his services in any sense of the word. That's, that's, it, it, that's it, it, it's clear decides. in my submission that this is not what Lord Denning was, was attempting to do. I, I have to say, speaking for myself, I don't find it quite that easy to work out what the key point of Lord Denning is. <laughs> um, I mean, even in that last part, he's put inverted commas around profit, not, not round not from. from. <laughs> quite. Um, and earlier on, back at uh, 396, he says Mr Mays didn't make a profit, he made a loss. And even if he had made a profit, it wouldn't have been taxable. So he is saying there was no profit. Yes, uh, but in my submission, if, if that's what his lordship is saying, what he's not doing is dealing with an analysis of, of gross or net. He's, he's just saying he's there talking is about the profit on the sale of the house. 
yes. not profit in the income tax sense. But, but my lord, yes. Um, and if he is, if his lordship is saying uh, something else, with the greatest of respect, it's not at all consistent with the other members of the house. And just, I, I think this is obvious, but if we go to the end of the first paragraph on 397, Lord Denning says, if Mr. Mays had been injured at work and received money compensation for his injuries, no one would suggest that it was a profit from his employment, nor so here where all he receives is compensation for his loss. Um, so if you're injured at work and receive money compensation, the, the money compensation is not, you say, from the employment. Or is it not as straightforward? Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's, it's that straightforward. I think it comes back to my lady's point earlier about some of the difficulties that might arise depending on the reason different parts of the award that's paid are yes. being paid. The personal injury part of it would not be the compensation for pain, and loss of amenities and so forth. But the employment part of it, the loss of future earnings, most certainly would be. Um, but it wouldn't be uh, it, because of the peculiarities of the way that the system works. Nobody gets paid the tax. I mean, the tax is notionally deducted, and what the injured party gets is uh, a net figure, uh, net of the tax that they would have had to pay if they were to earn. So, that, uh, and the thinking behind that, I think, is to avoid uh, over recovery. Yes, and one one can understand that. Yeah, um, but but it may not matter in this particular context that that happens because uh, there wouldn't be any question then of uh, uh, of taxing that money in their hands twice. My lady, yes. Um, we say that properly understood that th this case is nothing of the sort that, uh, that it's used for uh, as the proposition that net and gross profits, uh, or there should be some additional calculation of the word profit on the basis of net or gross profits. Yeah. Uh, this case was solely uh, about whether it was from the employment act, in my position. All right. Um, the next authority of the tribunal referred to what was Pook and Owen and Pook, uh, which is at tab 15 at page 163. And arguably, this is, in my submission, the high watermark of yes. uh, the appellant, uh, the, excuse me, the respondent's case, the appellant before the UT. Um, there were two issues uh, in this case. Uh, according to Lord Guest, uh, his speech starts at page 172. And at uh, 173, we see at the top two questions arise. One, whether the travelling allowances were properly included in the appellant's emoluments for income tax purposes under Schedule E. And two, was the actual cost of the journeys deductible from his emoluments under the relevant uh, rule? That being uh, Rule 7, which is extracted slightly below the quote. Um, the, the, the facts of this case, uh, before dealing with those two issues, are important to understand because they are uh, perhaps unique, but certainly they come up uh, that often uh, in my submission. Um, Mr Owen was a medical practitioner with various appointments. The terms and conditions associated with those appointments included him being on uh, standby duty. <coughs> Under the terms and conditions of service of hospital staff, the management committee paid Mr Owen travelling expenses at a fixed rate per mile for up to 10 miles, and then he paid the remaining five miles of the journey. He sought to deduct the whole cost of travelling expenses for income tax purposes. Uh, the Court of Appeal found that he wasn't entitled to uh, by a majority. Uh, Lord Denning, Master of Rolls, dissented in that case. Um, and this brings us now into... The, the House's analysis of that decision. Um, and, and Lord Guest, having stated those two questions, found that the entitlement to the expense was contained uh, in the terms and conditions of service entitled expenses. Uh, he went on at page 174, line A, to hold that it appeared to the, the, the Court of Appeal had treated the payments as allowances payable uh, to Mr Owen whether he incurred the expenses or not. Uh, his lordship took that to mean that the payment to Mr Owen was truly an allowance and not a reimbursement. Um, further in that paragraph, next to uh, this uh, capital C, um, 
that if the uh, payment were, n uh, were an allowance, then it would be a profit, but that if the payment was a mere, was, uh, mere a reimbursement for actual expenditure, different considerations arise. Having found that different considerations might arise at page 175 now, uh, line A, his lordship said that the allowance was uh, that, that if the proper test is whether the sum is a reward for services, then in my view the travelling allowances paid to Dr Owen are not among them. To say that Dr Owen is uh, to that extent better off is not to the point. The allowances were used to fill a hole in the emoluments by his expenditure on travel. The allowances were made for the convenience of the employee to allow him to do his work at the hospital from a suitably adjacent area. In my view the travelling allowances were not emoluments if I'm right that the allowances are not emoluments, then no question arises as to the deductibility of the actual sums expended on the 20-mile journey. Can, can you just unpack that a bit? Mm. First of all, Lord Guest says, if the proper test is whether a sum is a reward for services. Is he saying that is the proper test? In my submission, I'm not sure that he's committing himself. Right. It, it appears that he is prepared to accept because of the way it came before the House, right. based on what the Court of Appeal had said about reimbursements and expenditure. Th then, then having said at um, 174, the distinction between Ferguson and Noble in this case is that one's an allowance and the other's reimbursement, in the passage at the top of page 175 he consistently talks about allowances. Yes. So, what, 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 does he, means, he means reimbursement, does he? It, or in not. my submission, he must. Having found what he did earlier on, he must <coughs> mean reimbursement. Um, and I have to confess, when I read his use of the, his lordship's use of the word reimbursement, I had rather assumed that he meant uh, sorry expenses. He meant reimbursement because he, as I've, I've understood correctly, Doctor Owen spent more on his journeys than um, the. The, the, the money yes. that he got from the hospital. Yes. yes. The money was a contribution to what he had to outlay, but not all of it. My lady, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I'm afraid that, that I can't do better than words on the page. Well, it, I, think, it's I think Lord Reed but, shared your puzzlement. Yes. <laughs> I, I think, in my submission, I think that's right. Um, in, it is important in my submission to read what he says though, his lordship says though, about uh, to the extent better off is not to the point. Because of course the upper tribunal uh, think or, it is or, to the point. Or, or thought that being better or worse off was important. Yeah. Uh, my lady, in answer to your question earlier, I knew one of the authorities touched on it. It is in fact Ferguson and Noble, which is the clothing allowance yes. uh, case. Um, Lord Pierce's uh, speech at 176, uh, yes, 176, <coughs> and it paid, what, having summarised the facts, at 177, uh, next to capital A, uh, his lordship found the expenses were incurred in the performance uh, of Mr. Owen's duties. They were therefore within Rule 7 and allowable. Uh, his lordship found that uh, the emoluments, um, the emoluments are charged. The and this is at one seven eight now, like next to line A. Emoluments are charged. These are defined as including all salaries, fees, wages, purposes, and profits, profits whatsoever. The reimbursements of actual expenses are clearly not intended by salaries, fees, wages, or profits. Uh, and his lordship does say, and, and this is doubtless a point that will be set against the revenue, is that um, some element of personal profit is intended. Is intended. Mm. Towards the end. But the actual way in which he decided it, I mean, it wouldn't get to Rule 7 unless it was taxable in the first place, would it? Well, his, his lordship found that it wasn't. I know, well, that's why I'm a bit puzzled. I mean, if it, if you don't get as far as Rule 7 to ask whether it's necessarily expended, because that's on the debit side. Yes, it's a, it's a deduction. The, the, 
there, this is part of the, the, the difficulty with this case, and, and <laughs> I, I make the point now that Puken Owen has um, been refined, if we can put it that way, by the later case of Taylor and Proven and reconciled by the upper tribunal in Reed, which we'll come on yes. to shortly. But it, it, it must be said that in Taylor and Proven, um, one of the uh, law lords confessed some difficulty at finding the ratio. Lord Reed. Lord Reed, finding the ratio in this case. Uh, and uh, that, that may be a view uh, a, a viewed, um, this court adopts um, with some, uh, some sympathy. But you do get three law lords saying no emolument. Yeah, my lord, yes. And, and, and that's, as I say, this is, uh, in my submission, the high watermark of the respondent's case, but it then <coughs> does need to be viewed through the lens of how it has been applied or, or refined subsequently, uh, which I'll come on to. <coughs> um, Lord Wilberforce, who was the only, uh, make the point now, Lord Wilberforce was the only member of the court in Taylor and Proven and uh, and uh, Pook and Owen, or Owen and Pook, uh, sat on both. Um, but his uh, speech starts at 181, or 180, but particularly 181. Are you going back to Lord Donovan? Uh, give me a I had already. Uh, yes, forgive me, my lady. Lord Donovan, uh, Donovan's speech starting at 178. Uh, his lordship dissents on the Rule 7 issue as to whether uh, the amount was deductible or not. Uh, but at 179, uh, his lordship found uh, in the third paragraph down next to C uh, that the definition of emoluments gives no impetus towards the view that it covers sums paid to an employee simply in reimbursement of expenses incurred in carrying out his duty. So he doesn't stop the sentence at the word expenses? No. And indeed, the whole of Lord Pierce's discussion of profit begins with his statement that the commissioners found the expenses were incurred in the performance of his duties. My Lord, yes. So that's the context in which they're looking at profit. Yes. And we, which is how one comes to see in some of the later authorities the analysis that it was two workplaces. And so from the moment the phone was picked up, yeah. uh, they were effectively on duty. Uh, which meant that it was there outside the Ricketts type context where a recorder would travel from London to Portsmouth and that wasn't uh, something that could be claimed. But potentially that's tied to deductibility. But potentially. Potentially, my lord. Uh, a little further down on that same page uh, under E, The court says, uh, on the footing of the travelling expenses paid to Dr. Owen simply reimbursed what he had spent, or part of what he had spent on travelling in performance of his duties, I do not think they should be regarded as emoluments of his employment within the meaning of Schedule E. I think the case is distinguishable from Ferguson and Noble, where a cash allowance was paid to an employee, which although he may have been required to spend on buying civilian suit, he has a benefit or advantage to him. So again, uh, there, there is an analysis here uh, by Lord Donovan um, that might on one view be said to assist the respondent. Uh, turning now to Lord Wilberforce's speech, and specifically what's said at 181 uh, of the authorities bundle. Next to uh, line D, his lordship says, I agree with the revenue's contention that the mere fact of being on standby duty is not enough. Uh, and then his lordship goes on to give a variety of reasons why uh, he was of the opinion that it wasn't enough. Uh, and this is where the, uh, in a real sense, two uh, places of work uh, springs from. And next to capital F, what is required is proof to the satisfaction of the fact-finding commission the taxpayer in a real sense in respect of the office or employment in question had two places of work and the expenses were incurred in travelling from one to the other in the performance of his duties. In my opinion, Dr Owen satisfied this requirement. But this is all in the context of deductibility. Uh, yes, but the, the later authorities stress that one can't really read 
own and Pook without looking at the issues almost as an amalgamation of each other because the, otherwise it is quite difficult to detect what the, the thread is that runs between the various speeches. Well, it is, it's, it's, it's not the easiest of cases, but it, what is clear is that Lord Wilberforce would have found it was taxable and decided the case purely on the basis of the deduction. One sees that from H 182. My lady, yes. yes. So at least he is clear. There's a, there's a certain amount of obfuscation in one or two of the other speeches, but that speech is absolutely clear. My lady, not a submission I could make, but I, I certainly <laughs> take the point. <laughs> um, Lord Pearson's speech uh, is a dissent, and so I won't trouble you with that uh, speech. The Upper Tribunal at paragraph 61, this is, this is where the Upper Tribunal deal with their reliance uh, on this decision. Uh, they have stated, uh, as we have mentioned above, the relevant issue for our purposes is whether the payment was an emolument. A majority of the House of Lords found the reimbursement of expenses properly incurred was not an emolument. In reaching that conclusion, the extracts from the judgments of Lords Guest and Donovan both suggest the key question is whether the employee made an overall profit, uh, an overall, i.e. net profit. On the facts of Owen and Pook, there was no profit from the employment because the amount of the payment from the employee was equal to the expenses incurred by the employee, and so there was no emolument. Um, with the greatest respect to the Upper Tribunal's reasoning about uh, Pook, it doesn't in my submission, begin to grapple with the differences between what was a reimbursement uh, of an expense in the employment and the situation in this appeal, namely that the respondent was not being reimbursed mm. in any real sense for an expense in the employment. Yeah, six, paragraph 61, the upper tribunal, um, more ac accurately would say a majority found the reimbursement of expenses properly incurred in the performance of his duties. Precisely, my Yes. The settlement sum being paid to him and the other officers, the, the respondent and all the other officers, uh, at all times, um, what well, was unpaid earnings? That that is what the upper tribunal, the factual situation the upper tribunal was dealing with, and there is no question that payment was um, was in this sense not being outlaid to reimburse mm -hmm. the success fee or the insurance premium because the starting point was what was the purpose of the payment? The purpose of the payment was to provide the unpaid earnings that was claimed. Well, the purpose of the payment was to settle the action but um, the, the amount that was paid was referable to the owner. My, my lady, I take, I take the, the, the distinction. But what it wasn't designed to do is reimburse the success fee or the insurance on any view. That was just a function of what happened to the money after the payment was made. Well, we're back to Sir Albert, aren't we? We are back to Sir Albert. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, indeed, uh, and as I have alluded to already, maybe even expressly said, Pook hasn't been without its difficulties uh, in the subsequent decision of, of Taylor. Uh, my Lord, you, you've made a point about Lord Reed. Uh, finding it difficult. Um, Mr. Taylor was a, a Canadian who never resided in England. He brought together an amalgamated and amalgamated several breweries in Canada. He became quite involved in the affairs of a brewery in Sheffield, which wished to expand and in turn uh, amalgamate three breweries uh, in England. He predominantly worked out of Canada and the Bahamas. He neither sought nor received remuneration from uh, the English companies, but they repaid to him the expenses of his visits to England. He was a director of the companies for uh, what was described as prestige, uh, but otherwise undertook no functions of a director, instead being given special, what were described as special assignments. He was assessed to tax in respect of the sums which he had received as repayment of his expenses. Uh, and Lord Reed at 196 identifies what his lordship I perceives to be the two questions. They be for, they are familiar questions to this court. Uh, the first, whether these sums were emoluments within the scope of Schedule E, and two, if they were, were they deductions allowable under paragraph seven? Uh, his lordship 
uh, went on the same page uh, next to uh, F and found that he had no doubt that these were emoluments. His lordship continued uh, shortly on from there. I have no doubt that these sums were emoluments. It was argued that they were not paid to the appellant as a directive because they were paid under special assignments. I can see no ground for splitting up his duties in that way. He was made a director with a special assignment. There was one appointment, not two. Section 160 of the Act provides that any sum paid to a director or inspector expenses shall be treated as a person of the office and included in the emoluments, therefore, assessable to income tax. In respect of the second question, about whether... So the, there's a special provision of the Income Tax Act which made these sums emoluments. Well, yeah, the, the, the ones that were being dealt with exactly by, uh, by Section 160. Um, his Lordship then went on at page 200. My Lord's just... That, that's the Benefits Code. Yes. Yeah, but that, that 160 yes. is the predecessor of... Of the Benefits, benefits Code. The, right. the provisions we looked at this morning. Um, at page... 200. Uh, his Lordship, and this is the, the point my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison was raising uh, next to D, I do not find it easy to discover the ratio decidendi of Hook's case, but that does not diminish the authoritative, uh, authority of the decision. I'm sure the majority did not intend to decide that in all cases where the employee's contract requires him to work at home, he is entitled to deduct travelling expenses between his home and his other place of work. Plainly, that would open the door widely for the ev for evasion of the rule. There must be something more. And then at the bottom of this page, again dealing with uh, Pook, turning then to the present case, I think that it's covered by Pook's case. It was not enough the appellant contracted to do most of his work in Canada and would not have taken the employment otherwise. It was impossible to have companies which contracted with him to get the work done by anyone else. That I regard as the essential feature. It's that made it necessary that those travelling expenses should be incurred, and that is what is required to satisfy the rule. So the, it's clear that his lordship was dealing with that deductions element rather than is it an emolument, because he's already found that it definitely was. was but it was an emolument by reason of the uh, statute rather than by the application of the test that was actually being applied in Book's case. Yes. Um, whatever that test may have Maybe, been. Yes. Um, if the uh, earnings or, or, or the, the money was generated in consequence of the provision of the services under the contract of employment, uh, then it's an emolument or equivalent. Yes. Uh, page 202 now is uh, partway through Lord Morrison's speech. Uh, and Lord Morris found in respect of whether the expenses were emoluments from the employment that they were. And we see that uh, early on um, in the decision, uh, in, in the paragraph 202, line B. And if I can just invite you to read uh, between B and uh, the paragraph immediately before D. But at 2.05, uh, his lordship uh, went on to find next to letter F uh, that the expenses were wholly exclusively and necessarily incurred. Yeah. Lord Wilberforce dissented in part uh, in this case, um, but uh, importantly, uh, he, his speech, uh, you can see just under there, it starts at 2.05. Uh, letter G. Um, however, he did find the payment of the expenses was an emolument uh, from the employment. Uh, and we see that at page 207. I mean, the trouble is that given the terms of section 160 of the relevant statute, it was mm. obvious, really. Obviously, wasn't it? Yes. yes. It, 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 my Lord, yes. Um, that's, that's what Wilberforce says at page 207, letter C. 
precisely my point. And that, that's where his lordship does uh, comment on uh, Pook's head. Um, he also uh, comments again at letter H, at the bottom of the page, mm. about what, uh, and over the page, because I'm asking you to read those passages. But now he's gone on to deductibility, hasn't he? Yes. Yeah. Then we've got a slightly minority view from Lord Simon. Yes, also dissented in, in part in respect of whether the emolument was, was deductible. Uh, but he found that travel expenses were an emolument. Uh, and he examined, he also, his lordship also examined Pook's case between 213 and 214. Starting with uh, Ricketts before turning to uh, Pook's case. But the trouble is, you're really dealing with deductibility. Yes, yes. But yeah, my lord, I, I, I take that point. Right. Uh, lord Salmon then at two one at six, and again at the bottom of the page, very bottom of the page, next to eight. I respectfully agree with all the lordships and the court of appeal that it's crystal clear that some do pay. Mr. Taylor were a monument in the yeah. scope of Schedule E. That's the extent it, it assists. Uh, 217 next to line uh, letter C <coughs> until the end of the paragraph at D uh, is the passage that I would invite you to read. Sorry, which page? 217. Yes, thank you. Whilst there are some differences between this and uh, Pook's case, what uh, I submit the House wasn't doing uh, was it wasn't so much departing from Pook, uh, but confirming the correctness of it to the specific fact pattern uh, that existed, namely that where someone was on call from the moment they picked up the telephone and they were reimbursed for that expenditure, uh, they in performing, and that, that's quite key, in performing their duties, um, that was held not to be an emolument uh, in, in the case of Pook. But well, is that right? Uh, or isn't, isn't this case really dealing with the debit side of the ledger and saying that it was a necessary, it, it, was, it was necessary for the performance of the um, employment and therefore deductible? F forgive me, you, my lady, are you talking about Pook's case or... No, I'm talking about Taylor and Proven. Yes, I, I, I was referring to Pook's case, but my lady is right about the, the, the takeaway from... I mean, do you concede that Pook's case um, amounted to a finding by the majority that it wasn't an emolument? In my submission, that the finding in Pook's case was limited to the factual pattern that existed, and, and that's made clear, I submit, through the context yes. of what was said in read which analysed Pook's case, Taylor and Proven and Donnelly which is another of the decisions the upper tribunal relied upon and so they, they all can consistently sit together um, according to the upper tribunal in, in read but the, the way in which that's done is through a specific analysis of what was found in Pook's case I, mean, I, I quite follow how you can say in relation to Pook and Owen um, that you uh, can seek to tie the finding that there was no emolument to particular circumstances which don't apply elsewhere. But when you come on to Taylor and Proven, or indeed later cases, they're not really dealing with emolument at all, are they? They're just dealing with deductibility. deductibility. In, so I'm not sure that Taylor and Proven really helps at all. 
it, it, it helps in, in this way, in that it does re-look really at what was said in, in Pook. Uh, and on deductibility. On, on deductibility. But of course, um, there are the, the later authorities which we're going to come on to, uh, which say that in order to understand the deductibility point from Pook, one really needs to look at the judgment as a whole, including the emolument aspect. Uh, and so it's not a case where one can simply focus on, uh, on deduction, because that's not that's not how the case uh, hung <coughs> together in my, in my submission. Um, but whatever one whatever one says, and, and frankly, this likely applies to all of these decisions that have been relied upon by the other tribunal. What I submit they don't do is provide some kind of overarching uh, 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 guiding principle, which allows the word profit to be looked at as gross or net. So it may be that these cases do any number of things, but that's not one of them. <coughs> the next authority... So you would say, you would you, you sorry to, to, to no, not at um, all. interrupt you, you would say there's nothing in Owen and Pook that uh, detracts from the approach in cases such as Hochstrasse which are very clear uh, that anything um, by way of remuneration or services under a contract of employment um, is taxable. It's regarded as an emolument or a profit or however you care to, to oh, label it. it. My lady, yes. It goes on the credit side of the ledger. Yes. Uh, and had, had it been the case in my submission that Pukano was to be a sea change from everything that had come before, it would have been said. Yes. And we would see a slew of authorities <coughs> since Pook and Owen all endorsing a, a, an approach about net and gross profits and benefits, and was this an objective benefit or not? And, and what we don't see is that. Uh, we, we, we see very little authority, as the Upper Tribunal it, it itself acknowledges um, on this point. And what the Upper Tribunal has done is take these cases uh, on reimbursement or deductibility and overlay um, a, a concept which, in my submission, just isn't there. That, that wasn't necessarily what was being dealt with in each of these cases. I mean, even with Book and Owen, where Lord Pierce is specific about what he's talking about, he's not actually talking about profits, he's talking about perquisites. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. Any well, although, I'm, I'm, in fairness, I have to concede there is that uh, same right, piece to, the, to the decision. So, but I, I'm not I'm sure not any of these cases again. focuses particularly on the word profit. No, no. In, in my submission, that that is right. But it is also right that I I have to yes. accept that there are words on that page that refer to profit. Yeah. And I can't. I, I don't try to get away from that. All I say is that when properly viewed, mm. these cases aren't about net and gross profit. Mm. Now, I noticed the time. How, how are we doing? We got, uh, and I also appreciate your taking us through the authorities so Mr. Collins won't have to do it all over again. Yes. But how are we doing? Uh, very, it should be done quite shortly. All right. Yes. Uh, and it, to the extent it assists, ground three I can take very, very briefly. Right. Um, we were about to move on to Donnelly uh, and Williamson, Mr. Justice uh, Walton. At tab 17, and it starts at page 221. Uh, Mrs. Williamson, this appeal was, or um, well, the appeal was over £13, uh, which appears to have troubled uh, Justice Walton somewhat at the start of the judgment. Uh, the nut itself was obliterated. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my lord. <laughs> uh, she was employed by the City of Birmingham Education Department as a teacher. She attended out-of-school activities, namely parent evenings, and it was accepted that the activities were voluntary and were not part of her duties of the employment. Um, she didn't receive a salary over time or any other payment uh, in respect of her attendance at the evenings, um, but was able to make claims in respect of her travel. Uh, a scheme existed for the payment of travelling and subsistence allowances, which was administered in two parts, a part A and a part B, and Mrs Williamson made a, a claim under both parts. Uh, at first instance, the General Commissioners made four findings of fact, and those are contained at page 225 
at line F. Not reward for services rendered were not uh, round sum payments, did not contain an element of profit, and were a reimbursement of a loss. This resulted in the, uh, in the payments not being an emolument from her employment. Mr Justice Walton then went on to summarise the relevant test about whether a payment is an emolument at page 226, line F. And they found, or he found, that the payments, uh, or was the, his lordship said the question, was the payment received as a reward for acting as or being an employee? He then went on uh, in the next paragraph and found that the payment was not received for acting as an employee because, albeit somewhat surprising, that attendance at the functions for which she claimed the allowance, in particular attending parents' meetings, was not something which, uh, under the terms of her contract of employment, she was bound to perform. It was something which was entirely outside of the duties which she was being paid as a teacher. Uh, his Lordship went on and summarised the position from Foot at page 230 of the decision, at line B, and his Lordship found that all three approaches are all of one kind, and they can be summarised thus, the repayment of expenses is not an emolument. My Lord, uh, Lord Justice Newey, this was the point that you were making a short time ago. It was three law lords who arrived at that conclusion. That is the same conclusion that Justice Walton arrived at. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> they did with respect. <laughs> they reached the conclusion that repayment of expenses incurred in performance of your duties is not an employment. Yes. I don't think any of them said that repayment of expenses is not an employment. No, certainly not, not at large without free of anything else. Uh, I noticed there uh, 227, top of 227, Mr Justice Walton notes that if, if an employer pays the expenses of the employee's travel to work, um, can't be any dubiety as to the status of the cost of such provisions as an emolument. Right. Yes. So, so I mean, that's a specific example of repayment of expenses being in a monument. My Lord, yes. Um, the Upper Tribunal, uh, in reliance on this case, paragraph 63 on page 93 of the Core Bundle, uh, says that if there was an element of bounty involved, then this would be a benefit that would be taxable. But if the intention was only to reimburse expenses that had been genuinely incurred, then there was no real benefit, no profit. And so the reimbursement would not be taxable. The up tribunal goes on at 64, even though these cases are concerned with reimbursement of expenses. They demonstrate that the courts are looking to see whether the employee actually received a profit or benefit over and above reimbursed expenses, in addition to analysing the source of the payment made by the employer. Uh, in, in my submission, that is not what these authorities are propositioned for. They are all in one form or another about was there an emolument from the employment, and secondly, was there a, an allowable deduction in respect of the employment. Well, Donnelly's decided on the from test, is not it? Yes. yes. Because Miss Williamson wasn't required to go to these meetings and did it all voluntarily. It wasn't part of her employment, and therefore, when she got reimbursed her expenses, it wasn't from her employment. It seems to be why Mr. Justice Walton decided as he did on that, as he put it, simple but surprising reason. <laughs> yes, yes, my lord. Um, which really now just brings me to the final authority that I intend to take you to, which is the Upper Tribunal's decision of Reed at page 362, uh, a case uh, of some considerable complexity, but it deals with uh, the interaction between Pook, Taylor and Donnelly. In essence, 
the, the, the essence, the facts probably don't assist, but Reed Employment uh, was both an employment agency which places permanent staff with clients and an employment business which provides temporary staff to clients. Uh, the, minor, uh, the majority of the temporary employees provided to clients were employed by Reed. Reed made payments described as allowances to those temporary employees. Uh, and the first such allowance was designed to reimburse the cost of travel to their place of work at Reed's clients' premises. Uh, Reed obtained dispensation from HMRC with respect uh, to those allowances such that they fell outside uh, the PAYE scheme and were also exempt from national insurance contributions. Um, there were a number of issues which arose in this case, uh, but the issue that we're primarily concerned with was the second one, which is whether the allowances fell within Chapter 1 or Chapter 3 of Part 3. So Chapter 1 being the Section 62 uh, type case. When dealing with whether the travel expenses fell within this part, uh, the uh, court or the upper tribunal found at page 433, <coughs> paragraph 265, uh, they made findings about the ratio of who can own. Uh, and I, I would invite uh, the court, please, to read paragraph 265. 265? Yes, on page 433. Oh, I see. I'm sorry to do this to you, so I can invite you to read 266 as well. So when it says the earnings issue, that's the emoluments issue. Yes. Yes. Sorry, which other paragraph did you want us to look at? Uh, immediately following on 266. 266. paragraphs at 269 uh, onwards, um, the upper tribunal considered what had been said by Mr Justice Walton in Donnelly before ultimately arriving at what's said at 273 uh, and 274. And they note effectively at 273 that Taylor and Proven wasn't cited uh, to Mr Justice uh, Walton. Um, and then go on at 274 to say, therefore in our view, the cases analysed above taken as a whole support the FTT's findings in paragraph 246 of the decision that there is nothing in Pukenoen or the other authorities which casts doubt on the fundamental distinction between expenses incurred in putting oneself in a position to work and expenses incurred in doing the work oneself. The expenses incurred in Pukenoen, as Lord Wilberforce held, falling into the latter category and the expenses incurred by the employee temp in travelling to a permanent place of work falling into the former category and therefore consistent with the well-known authorities such as Ricketts to be regarded as earnings falling within the chapter. 
And so the upper tribunal engaged in this case on perhaps the bold attempt at analysing these three decisions side by side. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the uh, having undertaken that exercise, what they've not come away with is that there is some overarching principle about benefits. They, they've limited it to what the cases are in fact about. And it's, we, we do put particular emphasis on the expenses incurred in putting oneself in a position to work and expenses incurred in doing the work oneself. Because that, uh, in my submission, is really all those cases were... Well, that's at the heart of the deductibility point, isn't it? Um, it's the difference between the cost of travel and getting yourself to the job and cost of travel as a necessary concomitant of doing your job. Yes. But the, my lady, that is right. This analysis comes under the heading of whether these are uh, a potentially section 62... Yes. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't be looking at it from this perspective unless they were emoluments or, did, or expenses that were subject to taxation anyway. My lady, yes. Uh, although, um, I have to say that um, it's been pointed out that they would be treated as taxable expenses anyway. Uh, if you look at 435 at letter F, yes. F to G, there's a reference to the fact that in 1948... The definition of emoluments was uh, expanded to include benefits and expenses. Um, uh, expenses paid to directors and others. So, to a certain extent, it becomes a self fulfilling um, analysis, doesn't it? Yes, perhaps. Um, but you, re you, you say, do you, that we should adopt the, the, the same approach to? the reconciliation of the cases of the upper tribunal has? My lady, we do. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, and as I started with at the beginning, this potentially is quite a short issue. Mm. Was the payment from the employment account? Yes. Uh, and it can be stated that shortly yes. uh, in my submission. I've referred in my skeleton, in Mr. Ways, in my skeleton argument to Mayors and Horgy about a payment taking on the character of the thing it replaces. It replaced earnings. Mm. Yes. Submission. Yes. And that is no more and no less than what Judge Brannan found, and, and in my submission was correct to find, cutting through, e even if my learned friend is right, it's front and centre of his submission, profits, uh, about profits, Judge Brannan has cut through the issue and said, it doesn't actually matter, because this was all earned, and if it's earnings, it's tax. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's your grounds one and two, I think, isn't it? Uh, that, that's one, two, and four. One, two, and four, yes? Yes. Um, I'll just make sure there was nothing else I needed to cover off from those. Uh, we, we do say the reference at paragraph 75 of the Upper Tribunal's uh, decision. Uh, it says, in cases where section 62.2b IT for applies to such a payment, the court must have regard to the profit issue in computing how much of that payment can properly be regarded as earnings. Yeah. And so it, it appears that the upper tribunal is inserting there an element of computation built into the word profit that doesn't appear in the statute uh, and, and isn't properly read, uh, capable of being read in, much like it, it can't, in my submission, read in the word net. Uh, and that, that would be to some extent consistent with tenant, which is in the bundle. I won't take you to it. Yes. Um, dealing with paragraph 77 of the tribunal's analysis, the yeah, tribunal's analysis, uh, this is where it starts with its uh, analysis of agreed costs. Uh, which wasn't the issue before the UT, but it, it deals with its treatment of agreed costs. Uh, a submission that I made this morning about uh, analysing it in the way that it has. Uh, I can invite you just to read that, that paragraph. Yeah, not from. No. Uh, and that, uh, in, in my submission, is, is where it starts to go wrong. And having started at that wrong basis, it, then at 79 says, in our view, the same analysis can be used in respect of other legal costs incurred by the claimant. What does that mean? Mm. Well, 
in my submission, these weren't legal costs. They were a success fee and an insurance. But are, is the tribunal mm -hmm. saying that the proportion of the settlement sum that was paid to uh, paid by way of success fee and insurance payment was not from the employment? Are they saying that in this paragraph when they say the same analysis? Uh, I think they are. It's not clear. The reason I say it's not clear is because immediately before the upper tribunal is dealing with um, is dealing with Hochstrasser and Owen and Pook. And so to the extent that it has assessed Owen and Pook and Hochstrasser as being oh, cases about, a hole. about benefits, precisely. Yeah. And, and there they, they talk about from as well. So Yes. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's not, um, with, with great respect, it's not fantastically clear particularly in, in, in reference, be, because of the reference to Owen and Pook, which it has analysed to mean is about net yeah. gross profit. Well, that's part, partly why I asked you when we were looking at paragraph 39, what, what do they actually conclude on this? Yeah. But you, you say they, they probably did conclude in paragraph 79 that that portion of the success fee um, was... was should be netted off. The, the, the one it was which... not from the employment. I know they say it should be netted off, but yeah. the question is why? So it could either be because it wasn't from the employment, or it could be because it's not a profit. In, in my submission, the, the more likely outcome is that they've reasoned it on the basis that it wasn't a profit, uh, because that was the way in which the submission was put in the upper tribunal, that it wasn't a profit from the employment, because you can't sensibly be said to have received a profit if yeah. you lose 1.2 million. If, if the Eagles test is right, they would have to have found, if they were to disagree with the FTT on the from point, that there was no evidence that the FTT could have made that finding, because Mr Justice Finlay seems to have accepted Mr Simmons' argument that it was, it was a finding of fact. Yeah. It's all a bit. I must admit, I, I yes. confess that I, I, paragraph 75 onwards is a little difficult to follow um, because looking at 75, you think that they're actually deciding it on the profit basis, and then when you come to the agreed costs. My lady, I, the reason I started as I did in respect to pointing to the grounds of appeal <coughs> in this case yeah. uh, and the way it was put is because, and I referred to paragraph 86. I okay, invite you just to quickly look at paragraph 86 because that may provide some assistance. I'm indebted to Mr. Way uh, for his assistance on this. Yes. It says it was decided essentially on the second, the second issue, ground. Which is why, as I outlined at the beginning when dealing with the grounds of appeal before the UT, that it touched on different aspects, but it appears that it was dealing with the profits issue. Yeah. That is right, is it? Because. Yeah, as you say, in paragraph 28.2, you get the second issue, the second ground of appeal. But then in paragraph 32, they say the question requires us to address two issues. So are they treating both the from issue and the profit issue as part of the second ground? Yes, it appears that the way in which the upper tribunal has dealt with it is to say we're mainly dealing with... Uh, the second issue set out at 28.2, but in doing so, we're going to divide it up into two categories, mm. one about from and one about profit. So when they say that they're deciding the case on the second ground, that doesn't tell you whether it's on the from ground or the profit ground. No, uh, uh, other than, it, uh, as my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison says, at 39, they simply, uh, they simply note they adopt the summary. Um, but there's nothing wrong with the, the summary. It's fine. No, the, 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 the application of the summary that you don't like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, uh, I said I could take ground three quite swiftly. Uh, I will, to the extent it's necessary at all. And that's a, a strong caveat I put in place. Uh, there was no evidence that it was necessary for the respondent to bring obliged to bring litigation using a DBA and using the words that the, the upper tribunal has at paragraph 81 uh, we submit that it's proceeded on the basis for which there was no evidence of necessity or obligation at all 
but there's also a tension between the payments were necessarily incurred and that was the way they chose to fund the litigation. My Lord has anticipated the, the, the submission that I was coming on to, which is to say, um, to the extent the UT in its uh, permission refusal has suggested that it was not making any new findings of fact, uh, that is at odds with the conclusion that the success fee and insurance premium were necessarily uh, incurred in order to obtain the payment derived from the employment, uh, as it has set out in paragraph 81. Either a DBA was necessary, in which case the upper tribunal didn't have any evidence upon which it could make that finding of fact, or it, it wasn't intending to make any new findings of fact, in which case there can't be any sensible suggestion that even the test that it has applied of necessity has in fact been satisfied. Um, wasn't it entitled to draw an inference from the very fact that it's a DBA? M my lady, no. Uh, now my learned friend has pointed in, in the skeleton argument to clause 1.1.1 of the settlement agreement, which outlines a choice that, that a person has. Um, there was no evidence from any of, uh, certainly this respondent or anyone else, saying that they were compelled, this was the only way, they couldn't afford it, they couldn't use no window or CFA as the upper tribunal uh, began to analyse in debate through the course of the hearing. Um, there was simply no evidence of other types of funding arrangements. Um, the, the presence of a DBA is not the same thing as the necessity of a DBA, in my submission. Um, so to the extent, as I say, it's relevant at all, uh, we say there's no uh, evidence upon which that Mm. May I turn my back? Yeah. Uh, my Lord, unless, my lady, unless there's anything else, I thank you very much, Mr. Carey. Yes, Mr. Collins. My Lord, I, I would like to start by taking you to some of the underlying documents which HMRC haven't referred to yes. so far. In the supplementary bundle? In the su supplementary yeah. bundle, please, my Lord. Um, Second agreement. The settlement agreement. Settlement, sorry, yes. Yes. There is no difference um, between the way the agreed costs are treated in the settlement agreement and the success fee. So if you look at paragraph 3 of the settlement under the heading payment, there it says that in exchange for the claimants agreeing to the full and final settlement of the settled claim, the defendants shall pay to the claimants the total sum of 4.2 million, and we will see in a moment that that 4.2 million includes the success fee. And then it says, plus the agreed costs. So both, both the success fee and the agreed costs are being paid in full and final settlement of the claim. Sorry, I wasn't keeping up. I've, not, I've lost you. Where, whereabouts? Uh, if we look at it, pay, uh, paragraph 3.1. Now I see, yes. Yeah. So uh, the agreed costs are something which are being paid in return 
out of the principal settlement sum aspect of the global settlement sum? Yes, you, you, if, yes. if we start from the top, we have the global settlement sum, which yes. breaks down into the principal settlement sum and the agreed costs. Yes. And then the principal settlement sum is then further broken down into the success fee yes. and the insurance premium. <coughs> and the balance. Left over. Yes. And then, it, can I ask you to turn to page uh, 63? This is clause 11. Shouldn't we look at 8.1 first? Other than the agreed costs, the party shall bear their only good costs in relation to the dispute in this agreement. What, what this is addressing is the fact that once a settlement agreement has been entered into, um, there can be no further costs which are going to be payable by the Met to the uh, to the claimant. So, for example, any tax advice in relation to the settlement agreement that's not part of the agreed cost. Well, it also it, it, it potentially envisages that if the sum that's been uh, agreed by way of agreed costs is too little to cover the um, solicitor and client costs. Uh, then your client bears those costs himself. That's what it means as a matter of ordinary language, doesn't it? Y y yes, my lady. Yes. And then, but what, why should you not be able to deduct those if you're right? Suppose the agreed cost didn't cover what? solicitor and own client costs because it's it, the agreed costs are as assessed by the court. So you might get knocked down a bit on cost assessment. Yes, my lord. Well, th well then you have... In your then case, you can deduct. Well, no, my lord, because on, on our case, we you have the Eagles and Levy case, which which I will go on to look at. But in the Eagles and Levy case, um, it, it, the test part of the test there was whether the costs were... Uh, whether the, the settlement payment represented the costs. And on the facts of Eagles and Levy, the, the Finley J held that the, the yeah. settlement payment did represent the no, no what, what I mean is, I think what my, my lady is getting at is, let's suppose that the costs as assessed by the court are, I don't know, no, pick a figure out of here, half a million pounds, base costs. But in fact, the base costs charged by the solicitors and counsel were 600,000 pounds. On your interpretation, as I understand it, that 100,000 can also be deducted from the principal settlement sum because it was part of the costs which your clients incurred in order to get the principal settlement sum and therefore reduces the profit they well, got from it. Is that right? Well, my lord, I don't think we need to go that far because we are, we are relying on the deduction of... The, we, we, the issue here is whether the success fee can be deducted and the, and, and the, and, and the settlement agreement expressly provides for payment of the settlement fee out of the... Out of I the know, but what's sum. the answer to the question? The answer to your question is we would rely. We would look at the case of uh, Eagles and Levy, which says where there you the can't. judge, which says you can't, which says you can't. In that case, the judge said uh, it's only if the settlement sum represents or uh, uh, represents the costs that you can that, that those costs can then be deducted in determining what the amount of the profit is. But what is the principle? Um, you say when you look at the word profit, that means net profit. So you work out what the net gain is. Um, so what deductions are you allowed when calculating your net gain? Uh, well, I, I'm going to deal with that directly. But if, All right. If, 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 if you're going to deal with it later, then no, deal no, with it later. I'm going to deal with it now. But it, can, 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 uh, really, I, don't, don't go out of your course. Uh, I, so. It's not going out of my... Can I show you how the upper tribunal uh, dealt with yep. that di direct question? So if, if you could turn to page uh, two... The upper tribunal's decision, and this is a, uh, and I think this is the crux of the upper tribunal's decision. So this is paragraph 74, 76. This is page 95 of the core bundle. So it it starts at paragraph 74. It says, that, it says that, as we have discussed, in our view, the reimbursement cases demonstrate that the focus of the court in these cases is also on whether or not the employee can properly be said to have made an overall profit, i.e. a net profit, from their employment as a result of the payment from the employer. That is the profit issue. Now, my lords, I, I know that you're not all with me on that, and, I, it, and I'm going to go through the cases, and I'm going to hopefully make good that point. 
Then it moves on to uh, paragraph 75. With the exception of eagles, the cases do not address the circumstances in which an employee uh, incurs liability or costs which the employee seeks to deduct in computing the employee's earnings from an amount received from an employer which would otherwise demonstrably be regarded as derived from the employment. However, in cases where 62.2b, that's the reference to the profit, so in sections where 62.2b applies to such a payment, in our view, the court must also have regard to the profit issue in computing how much of that payment can properly be regarded as earnings. These cases are necessarily limited to cases in which 62, uh, sorry, are necessarily limited to cases in which section 62.2a, that salary, wage, or fee, is not in point. So there, what the tribunal, the, 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 here the tribunal is explaining the basis on which it made its decision. So there's two aspects of their decision. The first is that profit means a net amount. It means an overall profit. And then they go on in paragraph 76 to what they regard as the more difficult question. And they say, this leads to the more difficult question as to what is the test for determining whether an amount can be taken into account in computing the amount of profit which the employee obtains from a particular payment for the purpose of 62.2b. Um, uh, my Lord Lewis, and I, I think that's your question. That mm. that's, what do you take into account? And so what the tribunal then did is they looked at the authorities uh, 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 to, see, um, to see examples of, 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 what the, of what the authorities have... Uh, sorry, uh, and, and after this they say... Um, uh, and then they, they refer to the, Hochstrasser, they refer to... Yes, my Lord. Finley. So, so they don't they perform say, uh, the test. But they, 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 they say in these, so they look at the cases and they look to see what's the sufficient degree of connection um, that, 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 that's been used in the cases in order for the amount to be taken into account in determining whether there's a profit. So, uh, as you say, my lord, they look at Hostress from Mays and they say, well, in that case, the formulation that Lord Denning used in that case was whether the, uh, the amount was in connection with the employment. Um, so, Lord Denning said that, that's. It, it, on, on the facts of that case, that's what he took into account. Uh, and, and the way he formulated was that he wouldn't take into account something which was um, the employee's own affair and nothing to do with the employment. So they look at Hostress. That's mixing up the from test with the profits test. Sorry, say again, my lady. I said that is mixing up the from test with the profits test. What Lord Denning's it, distinction is about it is whether or not this is a profit em emerging from somebody's employment or not. So when he's talking about a loss or expense, which is the employee's own affair, he's talking about something that's not connected with the employment. Um, and what the tribunal appears to be doing is taking that out of context and applying it to the profits test. Uh, my lady, I, I, with respect, I, I don't agree with that. Well, you can't, because if you, if you were, then it would drive a coach and horses through your argument. So I want to know what the answer to it is. <laughs> could, could we turn up, Ostressa? Do you want to do, do it after two, lunch? Two o'clock, Mr Collins. Oh. I think it gives you time to pause and gather your thoughts. Um, and would you be good enough to point us to where the upper tribunal does formulate the test that it proposes to apply? It, it, it's in, it's in, in, in that paragraph, they, after having looked at Hostrasser... They well, you, look, you, can, you can come back to it. I'd just okay. like to, like, what is the test that they... Having looked at Hochstrasser and Eagles, what is the test that they formulate? Okay. And what is the test for which you contend? I mean, it, whatever you say the upper tribunal puts forward as the test, what do you say the test is? Oh, I, I understood my Two o'clock. Four o'clock.